It's it's your show. I have my PowerPoint ready. So whenever you'd like to start okay. your intros, you can. It's fine okay. with me. Okay. That sounds great. So it, everybody's in and everybody can hear us. So hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Nancy Rowe of the Ridgefield Historical Society here with Barrett Jones from the Ridgefield Library, who's co-hosting the event. I imagine that most of you already know the backstory of the presentation here today, but just to provide a little context to start. Um, for many years, the Battle of Ridgefield has been studied and enjoyed and celebrated locally by local historians and local authors. In the town of Ridgefield, we have historic markers denoting important locations in the battle. Every five years, the battle is commemorated with the reenactment and associated events. In fact, we have the 245th anniversary celebrations coming up in just one month. In 2019, however, a local discovery prompted renewed and intense curiosity about the battle and took it to a whole new level. That discovery was, of course, the skeletons. There's nothing quite like a skeleton to command attention. In late 2019, human skeletal remains were discovered under a house near Main Street. The bodies were determined to not be present day, and while they're still being examined, they're believed to be the remains of soldiers who fought in the Battle of Ridgefield. That discovery strongly suggested that there was more to learn about the battle. That discovery also prompted a research grant from the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program, which was awarded to the Historical Society in collaboration with SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, and with the town of Ridgefield support. This grant allowed for the first time ever in-depth historic research by professional historians. And since then, much has been learned. The results of that phase, first phase grant research are being presented tonight. Our speaker is Dr. David Namak, field researcher and historian with Heritage Consultants. David has been immersed in this project for many months, working alongside the Historical Society and our project director, Sharon Dunphy, as well as SHPO. I think I can say with complete confidence that when you hear Dr. Namek speaking tonight, you will recognize that he knows more about the Battle of Ridgefield and its context within the American Revolution than almost anybody else you've ever met. Probably more than anybody you've ever met, of course. Our format tonight is a presentation followed by a Q&A. Please feel free to send your questions in via chat and we will bring them up at the end of the presentation. On that note, Dr. Namek. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me testing. Things are going well. Thanks for that uh, great introduction. That's a lot to live up to, but uh, we will uh, I guarantee there will be uh, at least hopefully some new information uh, for even the most uh, well-read uh, researcher into this event, the Battle of Bridgefield. So I'd like to, on you know, behalf of uh, Heritage Consultants, again, thank Bridgefield Historical Society, the town of Bridgefield for having us tonight. And for each and every one of you that have uh, signed up for this event, um, uh, we have quite the great turnout and you know, I'm looking forward to, and the Historical Society is looking forward to sharing uh, our findings with you today. So with that said, I am going to hopefully share screen and move on to our feature presentation here, our, our discussion of the Battle of Bridgefield. Most of the information I'd like to share is it's going to be up on the screen here. So as the um, uh, Richfield Library had um, advertised, and, and also thank you to the Richfield Library for hosting this, co-hosting this, uh, this is reconstructing the April 27th, 1777 Battle of Richfield. And there's a number of partners uh, involved in this study. And we'll discuss a number of them today. I should have had an entire page of acknowledgements because really this is a, a group effort um, in addition to uh, the research team at Heritage Consultants. And at the bottom of the screen there, I'd like to um, call attention to uh, my other co-researchers who've been leading up the effort here, uh, Dr. Kevin McBride, who may or may not be with us here tonight, and uh, David George, the Director of Heritage Consultants, and most of the, all of the contemporary maps that you'll be seeing here that are included in our technical report have been done by uh, William Keegan. Um, so uh, enjoy. And let's move forward with our presentation today <clears throat> and get this moving here. So with that said, if there's uh, questions that pop up, uh, feel free to chat them or send them to our moderator. There will be uh, a 
uh, opportunity at the end of the presentation to ask some questions and I can elaborate. And there's just so much that could be shared um, in regards to this project. I tried to boil it down to about as much material as I could fit into this hour, hour and a half presentation. So generally we're gonna start looking at project background. Um, a lot of that was already covered uh, by, by uh, Nancy Rowe and the research process uh, generally, what uh, has been going on um, over the past year, uh, year and a half. And that will be summed up in the battle narrative slash findings, uh, uh, discussion history of, of the event, which we'll focus on and look at the maps and uh, have a, a liberal use of uh, contemporary military historical art that is chosen to help uh, make a point, bring a little um, uh, animation to this process and to, to bring the history to light. So with that said, I will also discuss the next phase of research because this is only one phase of a multi-year process, really exciting um, effort that's gonna be taking place again, right at the, um, the beginning of this uh, 250th anniversary of the uh, American Revolution and, and the uh, independence of the United States. So with that said, if I can again, get this moving on here. A lot of this was covered by Nancy. So it saves me a lot of time uh, in the introduction it was just, Wonderful. So I'm going to sort of move ahead, but not to, you know, belabor the point. Uh, but these events specifically of April 27th, not to mention the overall Danbury expedition campaign, which which we will be covering. Um, you can't really study one without the other um, has impacted local state national history in, in a number of ways. Nancy addressed a number of them and has been Memorial Day uh, memorialized commemorated from there on out from again, historical markers to literature, to engravings, to art onwards and so forth. Um, there are also a, a number of rich local oral traditions, early town histories, veterans interviews, um, local interviews, artifacts, and, and an intact historical landscape that help provide tangible links to uh, this important event in American history in the earliest days of, of the United States and local history here in Connecticut. Um, one of only a few land battles uh, fought here in the state. Um, we'll see a number of these monuments. We'll discuss commemorations. Uh, there are museums in Richfield uh, between the Historical Society and the Keeler Tavern. Um, and I can only imagine there'll be uh, more sort of uh, history and exhibits and, and products that come out of this, this project uh, that one can um, look forward to in the future. Archaeological discoveries have been uh, mentioned and there have been more since. No, not more burials, but more artifacts that have been found related directly to the Battle of Ridgefield, thanks to the efforts of some local historians, detectorists, uh, Ridgefield Historical Society members. And uh, I will get into shortly this, this 2020 National Park Service uh, grant that uh, this is a product of that we're we're enjoying here at the moment. And again, the anniversary of the battle is, is now. <laughs> it's coming up shortly in about a month from now. So uh, you'll hear more of that in the Historical Society. Uh, you'll hear more from my, myself, I'm sure, and other historians. And it'll just be a lot to um, enjoy for those of us that are interested in this, this important piece of American history. So uh, all of this historical research uh, and that's summed up in this, this presentation today is, is a result of this really fantastic program that is uh, funded by the National Park Service, your tax dollars at work, uh, American Battlefield Protection Program, ABPP for short, if you ever hear me spit that out or if you see that um, in any slides. And at some point, uh, do look it up uh, online, it's, it's been around for, I don't know, two decades now, probably late 90s, perhaps. And originally it was a program designed to broadly promote the preservation of significant battlefields on American soil. Uh, but largely uh, the earliest grants, if you went look back year after year, what was awarded were generally American Civil War and American Revol uh, Revolutionary War uh, projects, which, which Richfield you know, clearly 
fits right into. So um, it's also uh, a priority, I should say, is given to battlefields or battlefield sites um, that are threatened um, by any sorts of any number of development or uh, or or, or uh, it, 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 you know uh, um, events that could impact the battlefield. And it, it's also designed to protect battlefield sites and these associated sites that are critical to American history, but perhaps over, overlooked or haven't been perhaps investigated or commemorated uh, to maybe a full extent in the past. Encourages protection management, interpretation of these historical sites, raises awareness for the importance of preserving these sites for future generations. And that's a, it's a big part of it too, to raise the vis visibility of these important Battlefields, in this case, Ridgefield, which again, in town and in the local area is very well known, but frankly, not so much in the rest of Connecticut. Um, I'm uh, uh, talking to you today from the far reaches of Eastern Connecticut over here in Windham County. And uh, you know, for many years, I, you know, I was well aware of Fort Griswold, Burning New London, but that's kind of, you know, wasn't so much aware of what was happening over, um, uh, in Western Connecticut, right? So this this hopefully will bridge that gap uh, and and you know, spread the the word throughout New England as well. And uh, for Connecticut, there's been battlefield projects done since about 2007, if I recall. Um, Dr. Kevin McBride had really um, and, and the Mashantucket uh, Pequot tribe, I should say, through the Mashantucket Pequot uh, Museum and Research Center, had really spearheaded. This battlefield conflict archaeology here in in the Northeast, frankly, Connecticut for sure, New England, um, with Pequot War projects, Battle of Mystic Fort, investigating and identifying the first English military installation, in Connecticut at Saybrook, uh, down in Western Connecticut. For those of you out that way today, uh, down in Southport, the last battle of the Pequot War, again was studied by. Dr. McBride uh, and myself as, as the chief historian and archeologist in many cases. Uh, the burning of Essex in uh, War of 1812 uh, and also the battle of Stonington Borough in, in 18, uh, it's under the War of 1812 as well, uh, have been recently um, investigated by Dr. McBride. And now we have finally bridging that gap, filling the gap, the Revolutionary War Project, the Battle of Bridgefield. So, here we are being funded by the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program, fantastic uh, program. That's only increased in funding um, through Congress over the years and uh, seems to be supported by both sides of the aisle, surprising. Um, and in any case, there's also three phases to the American Battlefield Protection Program grant. And phase one is, is what uh, we have at Heritage Consultants and Richfield Historical Society have more or less uh, completed at the moment. And this is the planning and consensus building phase of these grants where you are, uh, one conducts research, documentary research, artifact research in an effort to, through the historical record and the landscape uh, and oral traditions, identify prospective battlefield locations. I mean, it's pretty clear in Ridgefield, there's markers everywhere for a first, second, third engagement, uh, yet there's you know, cannonballs and artifacts strewn all up and down you know, Ridgeberry Road, New Salem Road. So there's clearly a lot of actions taking place outside of those three known engagements, right? So what, what else can be identified? What boundaries can um, ultimately be, be formed, but in this case, identifying prospective sites, determining if the, the landscape's intact or not, creating mapping, military uh, uh, terrain analysis, you'll see a lot of that tonight, and, and really importantly, obtaining at this early time permissions from landholders to conduct future archaeology, um, a battlefield survey on their property, because the Battle of Ridgefield, any of these battlefield sites consist of dozens, um, most often hundreds of, of, of individual landholders and also state and local um, uh, uh, stakeholders, right? So there's a lot of people you got to get on board and Ridgefield Historical Society and the local uh, community has, has done a great job at this early time of, of getting together um, a, a, uh, a core group of, of permissions and they're always looking for more and you can reach out to Ridgefield if you 
find yourself along the battlefield group we're looking at today. Now, phase two, which is what Ridgefield's going to be moving into, is the site identification, documentation, where you take this, this historical analysis that we are presenting today and, and ground truthing it, actually uh, going to those prospective sites once landholder permission is uh, secured and uh, doing generally metal detecting and subsur subsurface testing, generally looking for metal objects, musket balls, cannonballs, equipment that can be used to create these boundaries of where actions occur. The Park Service doesn't want every single artifact found because therefore you don't have a, a battlefield a landscape anymore to protect if you've just uh, you know, you know, um, uncovered every artifact. So they, you need to, one needs to find just enough to tell the The next uh, phase of understanding if, if these hypotheses you're going to listen to tonight, if they're correct or not, it's gonna be the archeological record that will prove this or not in the end. There's always surprises. And Dr. McBride and I always like to say that, uh, you know, you always have to challenge your assumptions. You're, you're, always, you're always wrong until, I guess, proven otherwise. So phase three would be the interpretation and education, which uh, is, is where the Park Service will fund the creation, the, uh, the development of the, the creation of, but not fabrication of like historical signage of exhibits uh, perhaps different publications and uh, um, uh, educational programming, things of that nature. So it's a really exciting grant in general. I know you're not here to hear about this entire grant and the, the depths of it, but just to let you know, this is gonna be an ongoing process. You're hearing about the research and, and really only research tonight. So these phase one objectives, uh, again, uh, when you're seeing some of the uh, outcomes on the right, um, historical uh, engravings, at least in this case of David Worcester, some artifacts that were found by our, our local uh, uh, detectorists and historians, and at the bottom, uh, some, some of these maps are going to be seen today. But uh, identify materials that are there from the time of the battle, local, state, federal records, British accounts, newspapers, are rich sources, and uh, there's uh, strong oral traditions in the area. Um, interviews, veterans accounts that that when looked at as a whole, um, really provide a lot of information on this this um, event. But looking at looked at individually as some as some of the Ridgefield Historical Society volunteers are finding out, looking at pension records, there might only be a sentence, a, a bit of information, a little bit of insight. But again, you bring it all together, um, and it helps build these 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 narratives that we're looking at here. Uh, look at secondary source materials, uh, early town histories, stuff written after the fact, but uh, again, steep in local lore, local traditions, and, um, you know, stories of stories. But um, in many cases, almost in all cases, these, these, these local oral traditions tend to pan out once you cross-reference them with the historical record and the archaeological record, as uh, Kevin and I often find out. Historical maps, that's that's Keegan's world right there. Bill Keegan, our, our historical cartographer. And um, it's really important to figure out um, is, is, uh, to, to gather as, as many different local maps clearly as possible, spanning time. And as if they're, they might only be chunks of this entire route. They might only be certain areas of road, but as, as Mr. Keegan always likes to you know, explain again, it, we're, we're kind of connecting the dots here and building the maps and the roads in between, you know, these existing sources we have. You'll see some of uh, those results today. And um, artifacts, monuments, signage, you know, anything there that speaks to where things took place and these boundaries. Importantly, core areas, contributing properties. This is language from the grant, but we'll be investigating some of this and seeing um, what we have identified as core areas, essentially for a second, third engagement and um, some other areas of combat we've identified. The Park Service, I should also mention, is really only interested in documenting areas where fighting took place and, and not so much, say, 
you know, other areas of uh, like that's, let's say encampments or short term stops or things like that, although they're important to the story, so they're considered contributing properties. What we're really after are these core areas and those battlefield boundaries. And again, landholder permission, which I'd say is a success. Everything, check, check, check. It's, it's been a success, I think, phase one um, in general. Use all of this collected data to form a final technical report. Uh, at some point in the near future, um, there will be a, a public copy, I'm sure, of, available online for people to take a look at. And, um, and you're seeing a lot of the results of that again here tonight. Um, one area of research, as well that we just I can't get into as great depth as our veterans research, but there's an ongoing effort by the Virginia Historical Society uh, and myself to study veterans records at large, determine how many soldiers were in fact mobilized. We're interested in the English as well, but on the American side uh, for the Danbury Expedition Battle of Ridgefield and, and how many of those men can be identified as soldiers of color of, of African, Native, American, mixed race descent. American, uh, excuse me, Revolutionary War records are sort of remarkably uh, vague when it comes to descriptions of race. Often the veterans' pensions are a little more enlightening or more genealogical research is involved, but if there's at least one, two, three, four, five for certain individuals, for various reasons, we could tie um, to this battle. But the problem is that you know, we might come back to several times is the incomplete nature of these records and, and the great work that has been done by authors like Stephen Darley and uh, Keith Jones um, um, and others to reconstruct records. They, they'll tell you themselves how difficult it is. So it's an ongoing effort to identify records, to uh, you know pay respect for those who fought for the you know, um, defense of Ridgefield, Danbury, and the birth of our nation, and to also you know, learn more about the forces that, that fought there. So in any case, a good number of these Connecticut troops that we aren't discussing in detail today, are undoubtedly um, you know, men of color, and they're just waiting for us to rediscover that fact. Can't get into great detail into the historical context of the years before you know the revolution um people that have studied this event or early american history you know you know go back to the, the french and indian war the, the seven years war essentially is really kind of like the birth of the uh well like maybe the beginning of the different factors that led to growing grievances tensions in the north american british colonies that eventually led to um revolution against the crowd, right? So without getting into those great details, that's kind of a, a review of your, your U.S. History 1 courses, revolutionary courses, you can maybe high school courses of, uh, you know, events like uh, the Proclamation of 1763, the different Sugar Acts, Stamp Acts, different um, Quartering Acts, Boston Massacre, different events leading to rising tensions, you know, eventually the closing of Boston Harbor. Um, that will turn a fraction of the American population, very loyal subjects, formally against the greater empire. Um, I think it's something uh, I always find interesting to think about is many historians will consider the revolution a, you know, in terms of thirds, uh, maybe a third of colonists were for this crazy idea of revolting against this very powerful empire. A third were very loyal. And we're going to talk about those loyal British citizens today in great detail and many different aspects and um, loyalist sentiments and loyalist soldiers. And then also a third that just, you know, we're trying to keep their heads down and try not to get involved or just seeing which way the, the wind goes. The war begins more or less as many of us know in 1775. And generally, I guess you could say it goes relatively well for the Americans if you, between the siege of Boston being successful ultimately in taking over Fort Ticonderoga as the British didn't realize the hostilities have commenced and gathering a bunch of ordnance that can be used around Boston. Battle of Bunker Hill, that you're familiar with, failed attempt at Quebec, but some of these early, I guess, arguably American victories, you know, maybe gave a false sense of, of, uh, of uh, maybe a quick end to the war for 
those American colonists would like to revolt. But you know, within that year, the, the Crown was able to mobilize and start sending you know, more troops to the rebellious colonies. And in 1776, the war isn't going as well for the Americans, for sure. Uh, it's kind of an iffy time period. It's, it's kind of amazing the revolution even was successful, but following that declaration of independence to Americans themselves, to the crown into the world, there's a disaster, I guess, uh, for the American perspective, the Battle of Long Island, where a bunch of American armies nearly destroyed, pretty complete defeat of Washington's army. Uh, they're able to more or less pull it together by the Battle of Harlem Heights after a successful evacuation of Long Island. And luckily, uh, one of those what ifs of history, just before Continental Army enlistments expire at the end of the year, Washington just sort of, well, it has nothing else to lose, launches this attack um, at the, the, the Hessian, the German mercenary guess, uh, garrison at Trenton and taking that garrison with little or no loss, great American victory, and others follow, which are much needed morale boosters for this, this American cause in, in its infancy. So this brings us into 1777 and sort of zooming in now to Ridgefield and the, um, well, the events that bring us to Danbury and Ridgefield, right? Howe's campaign of 1777, many historians will label it as such, uh, basically pursuing the American army and uh, focusing on urban areas like New York and ultimately Pennsylvania, but trying to at least contain this rebellion as much as possible after an American victory at Princeton. There is locally a smaller scale raid which will uh, precede the events at, at Danbury and, and uh, at Ridgefield, the, the peak scale raid, which is about half uh, the uh, British forces that were at Danbury were at peak skill, so about a thousand, let's say. And it, it was again another Continental Army depot, which was loosely defended, and the British were able to take it, destroy it. Um, and there was very little contact with American troops. It wasn't very much inland, it was very close to the Hudson, if you're familiar with Peekskill, New York. Uh, and there was uh, naval support, right? So it was a pretty quick affair. Now, on top of that, and um, other factors, which we'll talk about shortly, led to the, the targeting of the next uh, very prominent American Continental Depot, which is up in Danbury, further inland, thought to be relatively well protected, and that if anybody's going to attack it, they'd probably attack it from the Hudson, but it would be a gamble, right? So planning the Danbury expedition, here we have uh, the two British uh, commanders of, of forces in North America, uh, Sir William Howe, uh, and uh, what many um, historians attribute to the um, planning, the planner of the operation, General William Tryon, former governor of New York. So by many accounts and reading of Tryon, Try, Tryon, Tryon's and uh, how's uh, correspondences, it appears that uh, General Tryon suggests this operation in Danbury. Also being from New York and familiar with the recruiting of existence of and recruiting of loyalist forces, that is uh, New Englanders, New Yorkers, Northeasterners, loyal to the crown, thinking rebellion, revolution is crazy, wanting nothing to do with it, but in the case of Connecticut, being driven from their homes and seeking refuge in Long Island, New York, bringing stories of perhaps exaggerated stories, but not all that exaggerated stories of strong loyalist support in Western Connecticut. It was definitely harbored there. You can read in newspapers, local accounts, and, and uh, state um, uh, trials, you know, at this time, actually, the court records. But in any case, this is one of the factors, believing that Western Connecticut was very much loyalist, that perhaps marching a relatively large army through that area, taking Danbury, um, showing the strength of the king's forces, you know, it might turn others away from rebellion and towards the crown. Um, not unlike, you know, if, if one studies the American Civil War, the, the thought behind Lee's first invasion of the North, and, you know, results in Antietam, Battle of Antietam, Sharpsburg. It's thought that Maryland might go to the Confederacy because there's a lot of loyal, you know, Southern leaning 
you know, pro rebels in Maryland. That's kind of the same thought here in Western Connecticut. So troops involved are approximately 2,000. Uh, when that number is thrown around, I, I and others always thought it was like maybe a higher estimate, but really when breaking down the forces, it seems those American accounts are, are pretty close to right. You got about 1,800, 1,800 infantry um, that are detached from New York units. We'll look at that shortly. A very small contingent of mounted troops known as dragoons that will be advanced guards, flankers, just really quick eyes and ears. Six three pound cannons, which with 12 or 16 artillerists per piece, you get you know, about 96 artillerists. So that's often overlooked. And a number of wagoneers or slash teamsters, civilians hired to drive baggage and wagons and extra ammunition carts and British need enough of that to sustain an army on this campaign, which, which could possibly take several days. That's more or less what's being um, proposed. So there's a long list that are, it's been published multiple places, well-known, um, uh, detailed list of, of the different British infantry units and the numbers detached to join this force. So different units around New York are asked to um, I would assume handpicked 250 troops and from these six different regiments of foot, British regulars, these would probably be grenadiers, light infantry, some of the more veteran um, men who have already seen action, some of which at Lexington Concord and some of these other battles listed. So they are pretty veteran troops. Noteworthy is uh, Major Montfort Brown's Corps of loyalists known as the Prince of Wales American Regiment formerly. I'll often just refer to them as Brown's Corps, Brown's Loyalist Corps, but Prince of Wales American Regiment, 300 total. Uh, we'll have to keep uh, continuing our research into the Loyalist forces and we're not quite sure the number of which were from Connecticut, but I suspect uh, the researchers at Ridgefield and uh, at Heritage can figure out something. Um, um, more detail in the future, but uh, I would, perhaps a hundred were from the local area, but others from New Jersey, New York, other displaced, dispossessed um, uh, loyalist refugees in the region. The 17th Late Dragoons, known as the 17th Lancers, probably 10, maybe upwards of 17 based on you know, various accounts. And again, the Royal Artillery. Now, each of these British regiments in North America by 77, if I understand correctly, had two three pound guns attached to them. They were often known as the battalion guns. So each one of these six regiments would have two cannons. And I suspect each one of these six guns is one gun detached from each one of those regiments. And they, they might be closely working with say the 15th regiment, one of those six, six one of those six three pound guns was probably belongs to the 15th, another to the 23rd, another to the fourth onwards and so forth. Um, more artillerists than I expected, at least six to work the gun, as little as three to work one of those small artillery pieces, about a three inch bore, very mobile, almost exclusively used during the American Revolution, not, not much after, perhaps a little bit before in the Seven Years War. Highly mobile, easy to move around these, these rough New England roads and a kind of a, a crew service weapon um, that took you know between three and six, the full contingent being six, and reservists that are helping wheel around gun, the guns, lug the guns, run ammunition. If somebody's wounded, they can take their place. Um, so it was, it was interesting learning the usage of these, these artillery pieces, which play an important role in this battle. So let's actually get to it as it's about 7.30 here, right? So um, Connecticut's invaded. The British fleets are on the move from New York and moving into Long Island to pick up the Loyalist Corps uh, and moving into Long Island Sound. Some of uh, the best work of this has really uh, been done by uh, an author, Damien Greenleaf Douglas, The Bridge Not Taken. That should be one of those must-haves in your at Old Ridgefield Library, as well as uh, Call to Arms by Stephen Darley. Some great work on this prequel to Ridgefield. And we're just kind of going to give a, an overview and move on to the main event, because again, our focus is on the 
third day of this, this um, campaign. So General Howe, and whenever you see this sort of italicized uh, text, it's generally primary sources. I try to include as many as possible for us. Um, this is more than I can include, but several regiments, as we noted, were embarked in 12 transports, and they, they go from New York City, um, where the, the regulars are loaded on, to Long Island, where the loyalists are, are um, picked up and bound for Fairfield. Interestingly, um, noted by you know all the major historians, but um, often overlooked is the fact that uh, Howe and uh, Tryon had a had a, had a great um, um, faint plan, a decoy plan, to draw the attention up the Hudson or the Americans up towards the Hudson once again. So as you see here, a diversion was thought fit to be made at the same time up, up the North River. Twelve transports in which a small corps of troops are embarked. And they anchored off of Dobbs Ferry, again, close enough to threaten what's left of Peekskill and, or what's being actually refitted at Peekskill and, and other areas on the Hudson. So for many American commanders, especially continental commanders, the attention is on the Hudson. So with that diversion, the real threat, those other transports are going to Long Island and then throughout the evening heading along Long Island Sound towards Connecticut. By April 25th, those ships have anchored off of Cedar Point and begin disembarking, uh, disembarking troops on Campo Beach. The Americans have had their Coast Guard watchers out there aware of movement of these ships. They don't quite know where they're heading, but now Friday, 12.30 p.m., Brigadier General Gold Selleck Selliman, who's in charge of the 4th Brigade Connecticut Militia, we'll hear more about Selliman, is at Campo Hill and notes um, and sends word out to other commanders in Worcester and Trumbull that 24 sail in the whole 16 of them ships. So again, pretty close to the numbers. Um, it's aware that the British are here. So he sends out, that he being Silliman, General Silliman, for all the companies of the 4th Regiment, others to come as fast as possible. And the specific orders are um, as soon as you get uh, 20 man companies together, just send them on the march with an officer. Just don't wait for the full regiment. As soon as you got 20, 20 man companies, just send them marching. And the rendezvous point was generally around Fairfield. The, the supposed, the Americans believe the attack was gonna, uh, the target of the, uh, the landing was this Fairfield proper. So the Americans are, the Connecticut troops are uh, scrambling. The captain's log specifically says at 6 p.m. they land this first division, they land the second division, 7 p.m. So that's how's that for fast British efficiency. Both divisions of 1,800 troops are are landed. Um, this doesn't take into account the artillery and other um, you know support and wagons and onwards, but the infantry is on the ground by 7 p.m. in control of Campo Hill, Bennett's Rocks, and just establishing a beachhead and you know protecting the rest of the landing. Lieutenant Robertson, who we'll hear a lot of as well, has a, a great account being a uh, lieutenant in the Royal Engineers who was, was on this operation from the very, very beginning, part of some of the early planning, um, likely the author of uh, a detailed map of the campaign that we'll see bits and pieces of. And, and again, just a great sometimes hour by hour account of, of his, of, of the Danbury expedition. So we'll, we'll see a lot of Robertson. So he's mentioning we immediately marched to the hills and by the time the artillery and everything is landed, it's about 11 at night. So all the infantry is on the ground, the artillery, everything else, oxen, horses, wagons, whatever they have. And then they start marching immediately. Um, half hour after that, so about 11.30, one big column heading up, generally a series of roads that'll be known as the Danbury Road. So here's the overall a modern composite of, of modern town lines over some of the details of Robertson's map. So we, we have a few things going on here. Um, but in any case, it's to orient ourselves in space. And the order of battle, that is the number of troops involved in this campaign, let alone the Battle Ridgefield itself is just mind-boggling. There's a lot of different Connecticut militia units that mobilize, some that 
were on the march but never made it to any of the actions on any of the days. There's New York militia that is, is active and um, there's just a lot to keep track of. And early on, myself and uh, Keith Jones, uh, the author of Farmers Against the Crowd, sort of decided when kind of conceptualizing this, we'll just also mention the, the, the most active, well-known, the largest mobilized units and also kind of drop the commanding officers because, uh, you know, in terms of, of labeling these units, because it's, it, it's also unclear what commanding officers were even on the ground or if there's just um, junior officers leading some of these units. There's a lot to be desired in terms of completeness of records, but the 4th Brigade is the, is the, the main actor here in our story, uh, mobilizing um, here out of, uh, you know, this uh, Fairfield County uh, consisting of the 4th, 9th, 13th, 16th regiments. Uh, again, fractions of these units. It's not the complete roster. Every man enlisted in 1777 up to April did not turn out. Like, uh, 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 at, at best a half, likely a third or less of many of these units were able to mobilize um, in time for this pursuit, let alone the Battle of Bridgefield. And the most Americans were in action the last day of the campaign on the 26th. General David Worcester is the commander of all Connecticut militia forces. He's alerted, uh, being I believe in Fairfield at the time and um, comes to assume command and send commands to other militia brigade commanders to be prepared because it's still unclear where the British are, are going. The British forces are divided into two brigades. And we'll hear a lot about that throughout the story here, uh, consisting of about 750 troops each and three guns each. And each of them have their own baggage and wagon trains. Um, at the lead of the column, at least on the first day and perhaps in the, the second, so the 25th to the 26th towards Danbury, the Bronze Loyalist Corps is leading the way. Again, putting these loyalist local men at the head of the column, a number of which are from Western Connecticut, know these towns, know these roads, know some of the people along the way, these houses, they will be leading, being at the vanguard of this, this, this uh, British army, uh, followed by General James Agnew's brigade. It'll be at the head of those particular units, three cannons at the front, and then their baggage, followed by William Erskine's brigade, the most veteran and the, the, the overall effective commander, frankly, of British forces. Erskine is gonna be calling the shots and, and devising the strategies. Uh, Tryon's a figurehead, um, Agnew's veteran, but Erskine is a, really the senior officer. And again, those regiments, three cannons, the dragoons are checking out side roads, flanking, they're in the front, the rear, they're, they're all over the place. Um, and again, there will be uh, a march up along the Danbury Road. There will be initial fighting right as or skirmishing or shots fired at the British by American militia and a handful of continental soldiers that happen to be on you know, the coastline in the area here. Um, but after that initial skirmish north of Campo Hill, there's not much action for the British as they march up towards uh, Easton and uh, Reading ultimately. There's a, a small action that Robertson mentions again around the town of Weston Easton that actually slowed the British for a little, little bit. We're not quite sure who was involved there, but prisoners, American prisoners were taken. At Reading, the troops, uh, the British rest for a bit. Uh, before moving on to Danbury, which they'll, they'll reach around four o'clock. And uh, by all accounts, they're at least uh, uh, finding some loyalist support in the, the Reading area, being entertained by some of the loyalists in that particular area, We're also, and also arresting you know, notable patriots or rebels, I, I guess. So with that said, the burning of Danbury, the Americans, just to back up real quick, find out Silliman determines, um, you know, again, there's, there's uh, Americans on horseback everywhere trying to keep an eye on the British and not get too close to be captured. But Silliman realizes that the British are in fact marching north to Danbury. Worcester also suspects that. Fairfield is not the target. So now the Americans that have been mobilizing around Fairfield begin to pursue the British marching north. 
And there's about a seven mile head start the, uh, the British have. So it's the Americans aren't gonna be able to catch up. It's gonna be a driving rain. It's going to be a pretty tough march. It's gonna render most firearms, flintlock firearms useless from the weather. So I just mentioned that. So men is going to, with you know Worcester's approval as well, everyone's gonna be marching as, as fast as possible up north. Uh, around the town of Danbury, uh, Continental uh, General Benedict Arnold, who is uh, in the region, um, catches up with the Connecticut forces and um, uh, joins the command. And with Worcester ranking, uh, Arnold is, is um, going to be taking over uh, command of most of the Connecticut troops um, that, you know, shortly, um, Silliminal. Be deferring to Arnold. You know, Arnold's reputation is of uh, in, uh, is a uh, noteworthy, uh, determined commander. Will also, you know, demand respect from those Connecticut troops. So at Danbury, there's very few forces there to protect the arsenal. Uh, that decoy that we discussed shortly, I mean, a little bit earlier, uh, that's anchored off Dobbs Ferry, served its intended purpose. The um, uh, Commander General McDougall of the of Peekskill uh, requested reinforcements from Danbury of all places. So only hours earlier, literally, uh, most of the defenders of Danbury marched west towards Peekskill, uh, Peekskill to reinforce the, the Americans there. That only left uh, Colonel Jedediah Huntington of the, of the first Connect Connecticut Continental Line, Continental Troops, only about 50 troops at Danbury, along with Around 100 militia of the 16th Connecticut. Joseph Platt Cook is the colonel from town, and the, uh, the 16th was, was um, uh, on site early at the arsenal. And there was a small depot guard as well. But again, it, we're, we're talking less than 200 troops um, in the face of upwards to you know, well, 1,800 British infantry um, closing in. So they tried to do the best they can to remove some of these military stores, but there's just too much. So some of the best tents, the important leather goods and shot, you know, tools, but they didn't have enough wagons, not enough troops. And before you know it, the British who are at Reading are just entering Danbury at 4 p.m. And the Americans have little choice but to move out of town and take up positions on some of the hills outside. Danbury, and there's some uh, limited skirmishing, there is some fighting, there's some British wounded and killed, and as well with Americans, and it would be interesting to study that in more detail, but uh, we, we did not focus on Danbury as, as much as we did with Bridgefield. So with that said, the British immediately start uh, gathering these supplies, and they also find there's too much to haul out of there with the wagons they have, and too much to even drag into the streets and burn. So when Pretty soon, the British start burning down the structures that these supplies are are, are stored in. So these warehouses and churches and some private homes, uh, and this this uh, conflagration, this uh, the flames start to spread and and uh, catch to a number of different houses in town. And the flames can be seen in Reading, where American troops are under Worcester and Silliman and Arnold are starting to mass. So. Something that became clear, about as clear as mud, was the American mobilization occurring throughout the region because the alarm went out for different uh, militia brigades, different companies. Um, the 4th Brigade under Silliman was, was most highly mobilized. They turned out in the greatest numbers, but there's units um, from looking at our order of battle we put together from uh, various uh, other militia companies and brigades, 6th Brigade, 17th Connecticut. Others are turning out that are north of Danbury, northeast of Danbury, as well as south and east, and New Yorkers from the west. And depending on the direction they're coming from, it, it sort of depends where they're most likely going to rendezvous with, with massing American forces. Uh, the Bethel group is not on this map, but just south of Danbury, Bethel, which was part of the town of Danbury at the time, is, is where Worcester, Silliman, Arnold, and about 600 American troops are massive. But there's also Cook's 16th Connecticut. Others from the 13th, based on various records, are also linking up with Cook. So there might be 150, 
or more, 250, uh, 200 uh, Americans out on those hills. Uh, others in the 17th Connecticut, as, as mentioned, are appearing. Uh, the first Connecticut is keeping an eye on things. And one of the little known um, kind of, you know, unsung units of this whole Danbury expedition, especially the Battle of Ridgefield, are going to be the Westchester units. In this case, the third Westchester New York militia, um, maybe upwards to 60, maybe a little more or less, number of which are mounted uh, themselves on horseback, were able to really quickly move in from the Salem's, North Salem, South Salem, Salem back, back then, um, and move to Ridgeberry and, and bring up, um, you know, the bring themselves up in Danbury on the western outskirts on Myrie Brook and as fate would have it they would be in front of the the British you know as they move out of town but we have the third Westchester there as well so there's a number of different units mobilizing it's hard to keep track it's hard to estimate numbers I'm always trying to work this out with others at Ridgefield and Keith Jones and just trying to you know a lot of this is going to come down to additional pension research and placing units under certain commanders, and that's what uh, Ridgefield is working on, Historical Society at the moment, a number of really you know, great volunteers, uh, hopefully some of which are watching today. So Worcester believes there's basically two routes that you know, the British are going to choose from. There's gonna be the same route they came from, heading back south the exact same way um, to Campo Beach, and so Americans are massing at Bethel just in case they can react quickly if, if that is the case. Um, Arnold and, and others as well also believe that maybe they're just going to march west and, and go completely west towards Peak Skills, as, as McDougal fears, and link up with those ships down by Dobbs Ferry. So that decoy is it's still working, and really it's um, a consideration Arnold specifically is thinking about. So there's two specific routes. Americans don't really know. There's a lot of eyes on the British around Baird Ferry, as this graphic tries to demonstrate. Main American forces are south of Bethel, and they begin to uh, split into two divisions by six o'clock in the morning as they're watching, you know, the flames of Danbury, and they're trying to dry their muskets off. Uh, Worcester takes about two hundred of the the six hundred. Arnold's division, which includes Silliman, grabs another. You know, takes four hundred, the, the larger, uh, clearly of the of the two. And the plan from the very beginning. Um, as evident from, uh, speaking of volunteers, I uh, hope they're watching, one of the Ridgefield Historical Society volunteers found a phenomenal, never published letter of Worcester of all things, directing American commanders early on the 26th on his, his plans. It's not, you know, they were, it was up at auction. It's in a private paper collection now, but uh, we have a transcription and copy of the original. So Thank you, Ridgefield Historical Society volunteers. And, and, and General Worcester essentially notes exactly what I'm laying out here, that there's, there's two ways they're gonna march. He suspects that they're gonna head, the British are gonna head towards Ridgebury, south to Ridgefield, because there are some military stores in Ridgefield. He's, he's convinced that the loyalists are really driving the column and their intelligence, so the loyalists would know, or they know by now that there's military stores, not only in Danbury, but at Ridgefield. He also mentions Wilton. And he's mentions uh, another place, but he calls it. Basically, he anticipates where the British will in fact march. But at this point, nobody really knows. So they split up their divisions. And Worcester directs other American militia that are starting to uh, still respond, not to march north to Danbury, but to begin to mass around Saugatuck this early on, which explains later American strategy, I suppose. But with that said, the whole plan of that will ultimately be the Battle of Ridgefield is that the American forces are going to try to slow the British as much as possible, not defeat them in open battle because it's not likely with 600, maybe seven, eight, nine, maybe a thousand if they're lucky when everything comes together. But, you know, the British force is twice as large and twice as, uh, you know, veteran let's say, right? These are British regulars. So the point is to slow the British as long as possible to allow the rest of the American militia to mobilize, have the best chance as possible to cut them off no matter what direction they take. So that's, that's the plan. Okay, so British forces are on the march. I notice it's probably getting on eight o'clock here. So let's see what I can do in the next 20 minutes or so and 
stupefy you with some graphics here. Um, the thought is, again, now there's those two possible uh, roots of March with those black arrows might be hard to see on the map, which focuses, uh, you can see American troops around Bethel, little figure that's the third Westchester, let's say to give them credit. But it's pretty clear by about nine in the morning where the British are going to march. Um, this little asterisk here is to remind me to mention that it became pretty clear in this research, thanks to good accounts of time from Lieutenant Robertson on the British and Silliman and Arnold and others on the American side. Um, we had several events that both the British and Americans give us time estimates on and almost and every, not almost, every single time we can cross-reference an event like the British mentioned when they leave Danbury, there's an hour difference. So in this case, Robertson writes, we left at 8 a.m. Yet Silliman, Arnold and others write at nine o'clock, we di discovered the, the, the British were marching west towards Ridgebury. And that will, there's other um, examples of that in, in other parts of this study. And it became pretty clear, but hard to find good academic studies of that the British on a, at their own time, on a almost probably a British naval time, that's kind of standard across the empire and the, the naval, um, you know, the British Navy. Um, and or New York's on a different time, but it it's, seems to also be the case in the War of 1812, these other studies that uh, Dr. Kevin McBride was involved in. So it's not that it took an hour for the Americans to figure out the British had left Danbury, it's just they, they're an hour different in reporting their time. So in any case, the British say eight, multiple American sources say nine, and this occurs in other you know, parts of the study. So, I guess being uh, American centric and focusing on the Americans, the, the heroes of our story, I guess my opinion, nine o'clock is it is. So from Silliman's standpoint and Arnold's perspective at nine o'clock, the British march west along Myrie Brook and the, the road is still there today, pretty much unimpacted over the years. You can drive it um, uh, and, and get a sense of you know, the landscape perhaps the general landscape of, of you know, what, it, what it was like back uh, around 1777. But this column's a half a mile long and it, it's led by the Dragoons. You have Agnew's Brigade followed with wagons, followed by Erskine's Brigade with wagons. Things are serious now. Tryon uh, Try uh, uh, was hoping to stay an extra day in Danbury. He thought, you know, maybe he'd be recruiting extra loyalists or he would be well received, but it became pretty clear <laughs> from the hills around Danbury that Americans were massing and loyalists knew that they had to get moving. So the British are, are moving at a brisk pace. And uh, this American local tradition from Ridgebury recorded in the early 1900s in a town history, you know, notes, uh, describes exactly, uh, exactly the, uh, the British arrangement of light horsemen, then the cannons, but then the main body, three more cannons in the rear, the, the British themselves you know, describe this arrangement. So it's, it's pretty interesting, the, you know, veracity of the oral history. Uh, the third Westchester tried to slow the British, according to a couple of pension accounts. They, they mentioned being in front of the, the British as they're marching west out of Danbury. From the perspective of these New Yorkers, for all they know, the British column is heading towards North Salem. So they, you know, they're really putting up a fight. Um, somebody in local Danbury history, uh, local Danbury histories early histories, I should say, uh, note that somebody tore up some bridges around like a uh, Fox Run sort of brook area. Maybe it was this, this, this third Westchester, but they were a tough group and they, they started to lay ambushes apparently for the British along Myrie Brook and George Washington Highway. But Robinson mentions pretty early that the militia began to harass us early on the 27th increasing every mile, galling us from their houses and fences. And that's it's kind of an interesting thought and quote. And the British had a policy of burning down any sort of structure Americans took cover in. If they were fired on from houses, they would burn the entire house down. There's, there's a few houses along this battlefield route that you know, were said to be burnt. It makes you, you know, one can suspect, you know, that that's probably why. Um, but you know, again, not early on. So you, one could imagine perhaps the New Yorkers setting up ambushes, firing and falling back to the next 
ambush. There's only 60 of them, perhaps, maybe 80. And the whole British Army is coming their way. So um, there's also a local um, tradition that these light horsemen went all the way to the New York border, giving more um, kind of evidence that, you know, perhaps it was the fourth, I'm sorry, the third Westchester that was involved in the fighting. The horsemen are taking shots at people near the New York state line, which is only like, I think maybe two miles at that point from Ridgeberry Center. Uh, Robertson writes, uh, after getting to Ridgeberry, the, the entire column goes south now. It's pretty clear they're not going to the Hudson. They're heading back south towards the sound the way they came. And Robertson mentions that the Americans, whoever they were, a, a noteworthy group of Americans, not just people shooting from behind stone walls and houses, made their appearance at Ridgeberry Hill about five miles from Danbury. Robertson's really good with these, these miles. I mean, he's, he's also map making. And they fired at the rear in a great distance. They, they did us a little harm. And it's based on the mileage and everything. And, and those of you that know Ridgeberry Hill and have kind of driven that, that section of North Salem Road, I, I think it's that real steep, it makes the most sense that as one starts to descend the hill, um, that's probably where whoever these Americans were kind of ran up on the British and maybe fired at 100 yards or, or better at them. So in any case, they, they did little harm, but it's not like they did no harm. So there may have been some minor skirmishing. And this is uh, something that's not really recognized or, or noted or commemorated. This, the, the earliest shots of really the Battle of Ridgeberry are occurring along Myrie Brook um, and for certain on Ridgeberry Hill. Uh, the British are getting jumpy. There's a local uh, um, a tradition that uh, one of the old houses, of a captain that I, I named escapes me near the Congregational Church in Ridgebury, as the British went by, some of the inhabitants looked out the window and the British took shots at them, um, you know, thinking perhaps that they were American militia about to fire on them. So, so the, the British are, you know, taking a lot of pot shots, um, but there was a lot of time for Americans to Think about ambushing them as, as the, they were burning Danbury. Here's our, our a larger map of our Tryon's route that we're, we know for sure that he took, and a, a pretty um, um, strong uh, belief on Silliman's route from this common point at Bethel. And harder to reconstruct was Worcester's division, and, and you know, really no one has kind of tackled it. Um, William Keegan and, and, um, and his wife, Chris Keegan, did a ton of work. Um, and I should also say I, I lent a hand as well, <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what this overland route is and kind of what you're looking at in the, in the 1770s, landscape, 1770s landscape is three major roads of how you would get towards greater Danbury from the New York border. There's kind of always what was described as a lower route, a mid route, and the upper route, the upper route was more or less this George Washington Highway, Myrie Brook. This lower route was a series of roads that are, are, were known as the Danbury Road as, you know, coming from the south. And, and Worcester's middle route is today a series of, I guess you'd call them like back roads and, and some discontinued roads through some, uh, I believe, state forests. Um, and we included a, a, a real detailed um, kind of like road by road um, route in the, in the end of the report, too much to describe here, um, but difficult to reconstruct. So around nine o'clock, um, Americans also, or I, at this point I should have actually said around 10 o'clock. So around nine o'clock, the Americans know the British leave Danbury. Around 10 o'clock, they know for sure they're heading south. So immediately, um, efforts are made to mobilize the troops, parade the men, and start marching along these routes to intercept the British and to start slowing them. About this time at 10 a.m., when, when word gets out which direction they're taking reinforcements, haphazardly show up the six Massachusetts Continentals, 140 troops under Lieutenant Colonel Calvin Smith appear. They were en route to Peekskill. Again, the, the decoy was drawing troops from all over. They realized the real alarm was Danbury. They fell in, but showed up with no ammunition. By, according to the Connecticut Current, um, soon after <laughs> arrived 2,000 cartridges from Peekskill. Now that they everybody understood where you know, the immediate threat was, 
So presumably these cartridges are, are, are passed out to the Continentals, the first Connecticut, the sixth mass. But the question mark is, you know, and that could have been done rapidly. I mean, is this happening before Worcester and Sullivan march out? So the question we always have is, you know, once they're resupplied, do any of these Continental troops fall in with seemingly Worcester's brigade? He's only, you know, they only have 200 troops compared to Arnold with 400, or do they remain in Danbury to put out the fires and to, you know, who knows, uh, to, to salvage what they can? It's, it's just a, a, a huge mystery. Pension work's been done on the six mass and then also Massachusetts and their regimental uh, history, and there's, there's no indication. There is some, uh, you know, suggestive materials in the pension records that some first Connecticut troops were with Worcester um, during the battle. So at this point, we're going to be wishy-washy and say some or elements of these continental units likely fell in with Worcester. And there's there's newspaper evidence to that effect that was to that effect that Worcester was in control of the militia and continental. So there were some continental units with them. It could have been a handful of the uh, the units that, that mobilized early or the men that mobilized early um, the day before, who knows. Um, but uh, by 11 o'clock, uh, again, news reaches um, the Americans and the fact that the British really are going south. So the, the, the divisions you know, uh, begin their, their pursuit. And the plan is for Arnold with, even at this time, a larger division to be a blocking force to try to find ways to slow the advance of the British where Worcester will harass them, will attack them, will hit them in the rear. So to also slow them, not to overtake them, but to slow the column to allow other Americans to arrive, have a better chance of just perhaps capturing the entire group. Because they're really far inland at this time with, with no support and, and no reinforcements coming, no resupply. So in any case, Worcester's division might be up to about 400 men at this time, picking up some from Danbury, at least the other Connecticut militia, Cook and others. Uh, this It's still all speculation. As the American forces are moving, and as it's a little after eight, I should really get moving here, uh, Tryon's army rests notably near uh, Mimonasco Lake on North uh, Salem Road. Am I there? Um, yes. And again, local tradition, that nothing in the British records themselves, but many different accounts from locals in this, this area of, of Ridgeberry um, state that the British were butchering up cattle, at least, that they had, you know, taken from local farms and had been driving with them. There were sheep as well, so maybe they were, you know, butchering them as, as, as well. I don't know how long it takes to butcher a cow and, you know, barbecue the meat and onwards and so forth, but we estimate like an hour and a half. Maybe that's quick, but the British also realize, like, <laughs> time is of the essence right now. Yeah, you got to feed their troops, but Americans are mobilizing. Some British troops said it's speculative, but I, you know, I tend to agree with Keith Jones, probably loyalists. They know the area of men from Brown's Corps, maybe with a local grievance against uh, the grist mill owner, uh, Keeler, but they, they find this mill or, or direct troops to this mill a little from the campsite. They possibly march by it on the way. There's still debate of which, which road was taken, but in any case, because um, there's a, you can see another road to the right of this red line. Uh, but in any case, the British uh, target Keeler's Mill. They find flour, Indian corn, other grain, uh, flour, and, and just destroy the whole mill. And um, again, not where fighting took place, but a, a notable event where evidence of, of which are probably there archaeologically. So um, this would be a contributing property, which we're, as well as this campsite. There's no fight at this point in time. There's no combat here at this resting point but we you know the ridgefield historical society would very much you know want to survey this area the park service would like to know is there evidence of this encampment or the destruction of keeler's mill and as they rested uh worcester's divisions on the march on that overland route that we looked at earlier only a few miles away arnold's divisions on the march towards ridgefield village and they're en route and they'll be they'll be getting there shortly around one o'clock or so so uh, there's a lot of moving parts here. So here we are now, finally, into the most, you know, well, the actual, the beginning of what many um, agree is the beginning of the battle of Ridgefield proper. But again, I'd argue it has begun the minute the British marched out of Danbury. So the real 
first large engagement to the American British forces as marked by state of Connecticut marker at the intersection of uh, Barlow Mountain Road and North Salem Road is uh, what's known as the first engagement. And this is where the British now have begin to move out again. And the column is again, a half mile long. And we already talked about the arrangement. And the British, the first brigade and then second brigade mostly are on the march. They have passed Barlow Mountain Road as the Americans are coming en route. And there's no indication that the Americans strategically held off to attack the rear of this moving British column. Maybe, maybe this was exactly the plan, but in any case, American troops that were en route come along Barlow Mountain Road, maybe somewhere along the plains or where the school is today down there, Scotland, the school is it, start to ascend the hill towards North Salem Road, probably deploy from their column into a, a battle line and overrun uh, the rear of Erskine's brigade. And this rear um, is essentially the baggage, the wagon train. Each, each brigade of infantry and cannons are followed by wagons that are hauling supplies and extra ammunition and all kinds of stuff. So Worcester's division of around, let's say, up to 400 American troops, largely Connecticut militia, perhaps some continental units or individuals, overrun and capture this entire wagon train that is attached to Erskine's brigade. So taking effectively half of the British supplies and extra ammunition um, and, and being more of a significant event in the overall battle than maybe that's been realized. Um, because at this point now, the, the British are quite limited on, on the um, resupply that's available. Uh, this is a, a, at the very bottom, this, this primary source is from the, a London newspaper. And again, Americans took 40 prisoners, great number of wagons and horses. Um, we, we really get into those figures in the report. Long story short, probably a dozen or so ac actual British soldiers were captured that were guards and some were wounded. So maybe they were wounded in the wagons. And the, the other some odd prisoners were likely these civilian wagoneers, teamsters that were hired in New York to haul everything. Um, there's no indication of what happened to these individuals, but that, that might account for these varying numbers. The British you know, aren't interested in anybody but their regular forces. So in any case, it's hard to tell. Other prisoners were taken throughout the Danbury you know, expedition, so it's hard to figure exactly how many people were captured, but at least you know, 12 to 15 British soldiers and other civilians. So moving on, what's known as the second engagement, because I'm running out of time here. I don't know how many people I'm putting to sleep or anyone's still with me here, but uh, the second engagement, Worcester's division now reforms and it gives, you know, closely pursues the rear of the British after securing the wagons, probably the, you know, the detaching guards to you know, take care of things there. And scattered fighting occurs along North Salem Road as, as far as we know probably along to car as well. I mean, the, this fighting probably spilled over into the fields and British may have been marching down that road anyway. Um, Archaeology will, will settle that um, or probably bring up more questions. Erskine's division understands that there's a substantial American force behind them now. They've lost their wagons, that uh, something needs to be done. The whole division isn't going to stop. They are determined to march south. They're not going to fall for this American trap, I guess you'd say, of, of slowing down. So they dispatch a rear guard and they, they strategically take, uh, it's not as evident today because the road's been, been graded quite a bit, but there was, uh, by all accounts, more of kind of a rise, a hill. You still see it today as, as you're just getting, um, you know, towards Barrack Hill. You can kind of see it on the map there. And the, uh, the British set up their rear guard there. It was kind of on a height. And there was even a, somewhat of a barricade that Americans had put across there that they were able to reuse. All three of their guns were set up. The Loyalists took the higher ground to the west. And as the Americans came forth in a column, um, they started taking artillery fire from these light but very potent artillery pieces that could fire four plus rounds a minute of initially solid shot, those, those 
four, four pound cannonballs that, or three pound cannonballs, I should say that uh, one of which is in the historical society. Uh, you'll see others around town. Will be, others will be encountered during this project. That would be fired out there, you know, beyond, let's say, 400 yards, 500 yards, 600 yards. As, as soon as the guns can see this American column, they can throw iron balls, you know, among the troops. Then as the Americans move in closer, they're on this neck of land. If they're all on North Salem Road, we, we don't know how the Americans are arranged. They, they may have formed to some sort of linear formation now as they're getting closer, but they're taking now perhaps canister and grape shot, which canister being a bunch of lead ball, musket balls packed inside literally a tin can and fired at the in front of enemy positions. It kicks up all sorts of dirt soil, disintegrates and all those projectiles just, you know, tear into the, the, the battle line. As the Americans get closer into about 200 yards steel grape shot, the size of let's say golf balls or smaller, are raking the American line. So a lot of Americans are, are, are getting hit before they're even close enough to start opening fire on the, the British. And then they're in the range of small arms fire. So British infantry is opening up on the Americans. And by all accounts, uh, at this time, Worcester is urging forth his men to take one of these artillery pieces he sees, but the Americans coming around the corner may not have noticed the rest of the forces they faced. I forget who described it as an ambush. And the more I'm thinking about it, it, it might be, and this is where line of sight studies will be important. But uh, in any case, when Worcester is hit trying to mount second course and urging his men forward, it, it, kind of, it breaks the attack. Um, and uh, the Americans uh, withdraw and uh, the, the British successfully hold their ground. It's not clear um, how long the fighting takes. and. To what extent any British casualties are taken, but a, a number of artillerists star reported as wounded and killed by the time the expedition's over. It could happen any time, but perhaps some of those casualties happened in this direct engagement um, between Worcester's division and, and the rear guard. We have, one big mystery is what happens to Worcester's division afterwards. There seems to be no clear command. There's a continental New York, Connecticut militia units. Uh, no one seems to really galvanize the different units and 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 uh and press the attack again it's it's a huge mystery what happens in this division for the rest of the battle some of which may have worked their way to the to, to ridgefield and arnold's division but uh, there's no sign of them until the next day down around saugatuck so as i'm running out of time let's get through the third engagement that everybody knows the most of here's a 3d rendering of topography uh, that you know Bill Keegan put together. Some of our battlefield maps I'll describe. Third engagement's the most complicated. There's several phases that are well described by Silliman and you get a sense of it from the other supporting evidence as well. The British remarkably don't write a lot about this. It clearly, well, at least Robinson doesn't want to admit that it was much of a fight. But in any case, when Arnold arrives and his division around two-ish, um, there's another hundred troops waiting for him. So now they have, I mean, another hundred, yeah. So now their overall force strength is about 500. Arnold decides to deploy this meager force east to west across the Ridgeberry Road on this area um, known as the, the Stebbins property. And a, a barricade is also built across the road at this point that uh, anybody that takes the Ridgeberry Road back in 1777. As they come south from Danbury Road, they, they go down the hill, they have to cross a stream that's probably a little rocky and muddy, and then they have to ascend a steep climb with, with rock ledges on their right and uh, uh, the Stebbins house and barn on their left. And it's pretty rough land, but naturally defendable. So now with a barricade across it, it's, it's enough to slow any attacker. There's stone walls that can be used as natural fortifications. There's orchards um, on either further to either side of the road that will be um, used uh, by American defenders. Here's a really great map that uh, our, our guy Bill Keegan found uh, towards the end of this project in the town hall. Again, local resources are often the most valuable. And this is a copy of an original. So uh, again, uh, Mr. Keegan can go on for, for some time on the importance of, of 
all these early records and even copies. Don't throw anything out um, while you town clerks out there. Um, so in any case, this shows the, the Stebbins house, a barn, stone walls, uh, streams, uh, you know, um, orchards, everything um, that, that's accounted for in the historical record and veterans accounts. The western edge of this line is defended likely by the second Westchester, New York, who's come in from the south as another unit. The center line by you know, we can reconstruct from veteran accounts, tell by the 4th Connecticut, the few continental units, probably the Ridgefield local militia and, and others. These are just the most prominent units we're listening that Eastern flank is held by the 9th Connecticut. I'm seeing I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll just kind of get through here. Second Connecticut, uh, New York, 9th Connecticut deployed skirmishers in advance of their line, which is, you know, kind of very much a common tactic and slow down the attackers, uh, and give advance warning that they're appearing. And we have some really great accounts from two defenders from the uh, the Ninth Connecticut skirmishers. Uh, they call themselves the flank guards. Private Bell uh, were posted north of the Stebbins House. The road goes to Danbury. We're posted to take the British in the flank as they came down Ridgebury Road. We were behind the fence, eight to ten rods north of the Stebbins barn. So I mean, it doesn't get more detailed than that. As the British start marching into Ridgefield Village and the intersection of Danbury Road, these skirmishers behind the, the rail fence uh, un unload their muskets and the advance guard. The British return fire. It's enough of a sharp fight that another veteran mentions, I was on the flank guards, five out of 25 of us. So basically the company uh, were killed um, in this fight, essentially. They fall back to their main position, most likely um, to the east. Uh, on Grove Street. So the Battle of Battle of Bridgefield has begun. And it's broken down to three phases. I'll get through this because I'm really getting well, you know, running out of time. I'd like to take some questions and talk about other stuff. Um, but based on the primary counts, Arnold mentions he only has about an hour to deploy his troops. Silliman mentions that uh, the Americans heard uh, the firing of the second engagement, essentially, of General Worcester attacking the rear, and that they, they, the British, appeared in one grand column that filled the road for a half mile. That, that their, uh, you know, they could hear the music, their drums, you know, drumming and colors flying. So it was, it was a grand, um, intimidating spectacle. I would, I would think. Robertson, on the British perspective, gets to Ridgefield Village and notes Arnold's posted on the hills, about 700 men, so he overestimates by a few hundred, and that we, the British, about two o'clock, so about three o'clock, you know, our American time, attacked the village and drove them off. That's, that's all Robertson writes about. We just, we showed up, we came, we saw, we conquered. Well, it's a little more detailed than that. So, um, General Silliman, breaks this down into these multiple phases that we've identified. That they first began with bringing up all of their guns, all six brigade guns, and they opened fire on the American position for upwards to a half hour. As the British Agnews Brigade deploys skirmishers, uh, this flanking company off to the east, Brown's Corps, maybe half of the overall loyalists start to also form as flanking companies and the, the British are testing the American position. And at that time, they're getting fired on by the British guns that are ineffective. They can't hammer down the barricade. They're punching into the Stebbins house, probably not inflicting much damage, but expending a lot of ammunition. At this point now, again, uh, Solomon says the Canadian is six field pieces and this doesn't answer their purpose. So they send large flanking companies and warmly received by our outposts for a while. So that again is the fighting taking place on Grove Street when Agnews Brigade's flanking company is pushing the 9th Connecticut, who has a very strong position. The 9th Connecticut is on elevated ground in an orchard that's surrounded by stone walls. And you, those of you familiar with town, Grove Street's, uh, you know, where that office complex is, it's a pretty, still a formidable, you know, steep, position and the 9th Connecticut were easily able, I assume, because they held the entire time, they were able to hold, let's say, off the uh, British regulars pushing the eastern flank. On the west, the 2nd New York also apparently successfully pushes back uh, the flankers from Brown's Corps. More than likely, the British are just kind of probing, so they're not really throwing everything they have. And once they engage, they skirmish and fall back to figure out what to do next. <laughs> What do they do next? Next is the main attack. So with the cannonade not quite 
having its effect and skirmishers testing the flanks, the enemy, the British, according to Silliman, bring up an entire division. So this is Agnew's division or brigade, I should say, 600 men. Normally it's 750. 150 have broken away and are acting as the Eastern flanking company against the 9th Connecticut. Brown's Corps has probably been reinforced. They, they could have all 300 men, but let's say about 200. And now the main assault's going to take place. Large flanking companies consisting more than our entire force, three field pieces in the front. So the cannons are acting as close support to the infantry to start hammering the American position, probably a canister and grape shot. So that's the next phase is sending out the flankers, sending the guns forth. And then Dibble of the 9th Connecticut, who was in the skirmishing line and fell back, describes the attack as the British advancing in a broad front, which is noteworthy. So um, the column marches into position and wheels into this long battle line to front the entire American line to stretch their forces and to, to also maximize their fire. So it's a long battle line of 600 infantry now pushing up against 200 you know well fortified americans uh, between a barricade stone walls elevated position rock ledges it's it's a pretty strong position and a hot fire ensues on both flanks so now everybody's engaged along the line on you know in ridgefield village uh continued with great fury for about a half hour according to Silliman. Houses and structures behind the American line are being used as field hospitals. Uh, the church is being used as the hospital. Colonel Phil, uh, Philip Burr Bradley's house no longer standing. Uh, many wounded are being brought there. Um, Captain Cole of the Ninth, uh, Fourth Connecticut, I should say, mentions that you know when this large assault was happening, any horses they had were brought up probably to help affect a, a quick retreat or to move out the wounded in the Stebbins house. Uh, and Stebbins. Uh, Benjamin Stebbins, I believe, who was actually sick at the time in his house, stuck in his house in his bedroom for the whole battle. So has a front row seat, mentioned the fight was a bloody one. And he, he counts between 40 and 50 Americans killed. Um, his house being used as the field hospital and, and you know, uh, the dead were buried behind his house. Uh, the third engagement, final, final phase, really the turning point of the battle is, is when the American line breaks. It occurs... Uh, based on several accounts on the western flank. Abraham Gilbert, whose house was built upon the ledges, heard a lot of moral or, uh, local history. He might be a veteran as well. Mentions that beyond and north of the rocks where his house is, was an old orchard under cover of which the British advance and outflayed flank to Arnold. We believe, again, it was Brown's Corps for a number of reasons. So the Loyalists uh, are able to push back the second New York and uh, at least a platoon of which scale those ledges that are lightly defended or, or not defended by uh, the Americans. And according to numerous sources, one of the most famous events of the battle, you know, here from the Connecticut Journal, General Arnold had his horse shot out from him. This entire platoon took aim at the general, fired. His horse was hit like a dozen times, but Arnold survived. Arnold was pinned by his horse, and here's a period engraving that, that was popular in England of all places, um, showing Arnold sort of pinned by his horse, getting up and shooting his attacker that's coming to, to you know, finish him off. And Arnold retreats at that point, as does much of that west, uh, west, you know, west center line. The Americans now have British on their west flanks, uh, on top of the ledges. They've turned the second New York. They're able to start firing down along the American line and, and the 4th Connecticut, already pressed by a British bayonet charge, falls back probably in multiple directions, but south, definitely southeast. General Gould, who is the colonel of 4th Connecticut, is, is killed in action around the Apple Grove, a clearing of the grove. Uh, there's even a description of some of the rocky terrain he was, you know, was killed near. It might still exist today. And he's trying to rally those, those troops that are falling back. At this point, I wish I had the quote up there, the 9th Connecticut is still holding, but I think it's Dibble mentions that once the main American line folds, the 9th Connecticut falls back too. So now the British are in control of the Stebbins property and there's a general retreat. I, I wouldn't call it like a frantic run for your lives kind of retreat, but 
at least the Ninth Connecticut's falling back in good order, and there's there's uh, most American troops are rallying in town. So I know I'm almost about out of time here, and we're almost at the end of the story. In any case, here's some new information that you know it's always been suspected based on artifacts, cannonballs that are dug out of town, embedded in structures, but we're calling these the additional additional engagements. I mean, somebody else can label what they want to call them in the future, and who knows how many engagements are taking place. But as Americans fall back, they, uh, they appear to fall back along Main Street, along High Ridge to the west, and along um, East Ridge to the east. Uh, multiple directions. There's probably small pockets of Americans fighting. Agnew's Brigade, Brown's Corps, they, they're exhausted. They expended most of their ammunition. Um, so now Erskine's Brigade likely takes the lead soon after to try to clear town. There's interesting random accounts here and there of wounded British soldiers found here, and, you know, skirmishes there, and cannonballs, you know, found in these houses, you know, during renovations. I, I thought this, this account was interesting of of a veteran, uh, Levi Bradley, his descendant, stating that Arnold's men are scattered, his grandfather and some others run to a barn. The British turn the field pieces and make the clapboards fly, you know, from probably his grandfather's actual words. They got out and ran for an apple tree. Somebody's hiding behind the tree and either gets pushed out of the way or steps out of the way, gets hit by one of the cannonballs. Uh, it's, it just describes a pretty frantic, you know, ongoing fight. Uh, who knows where it's happening? One only has to go to the Keeler Tavern to see a cannonball still embedded in one of these structures where the Americans likely made a stand on the southern end of town where you see one of those blue boxes. Uh, once the British and the, at least three regiments are deployed with three guns, probably one, one regiment, one gun on each main street, Americans are just pushed back. I mean, they just are spent. There's no you know, commander really in charge. There's small unit actions probably. But this is the most that Robinson writes about, which is interesting on the British side. Like he, he barely talks about the barricade, but he gets into about the village. After being in the village a little while, the Americans are in the village a little while, the rebels again drew together, came up on a, a rising ground above the village. Here's the, the, the block of Americans down at the, the south you know, west corner. And Erskine, Erskine's division, now makes a disposition to surround them, but by different companies not advancing at the same time, they only drove them off. So that's really the, probably the last formal action in the Battle of, of Ridgefield is this, this uh, occurrence in the, on the hills towards the south end of town. Um, it's some, we'll learn more um, you know, in the future, clearly through archaeology. Hey, David, mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're bumping up against our end time here. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just going to end it then right now. I'm sorry. Because yeah, I have a few questions that people have asked. I've been saving Mm -hmm. uh, let me start my video here. I've been saving some questions that came up during your talk. And, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that we get to those before everybody has to leave. And, you know, if anybody's got to go, please, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there were questions early on uh, if this would be, uh, the recording would be posted later. And yes, this is being recorded and it will be posted on the uh, His Ridgefield Historical website. Uh, that that was fascinating, David. I, I appreciate it. I'm sorry to to butt in, but uh, one thing, uh, the, just a couple of quick questions came in. The question was, was it common for the British troops to march overnight? Was was it common for them to? I, I think basically people are asking, like, was it common for them to move so quickly? Um, as far as I know, I'm not familiar with every aspect of the revolution. Like, not unless it was, uh, you know, as in a really desperate situation. I'm sure that some accounts have happened in the South. Um, it, it was noted several times that the British were marching with haste. They, they knew that time was of the essence, especially after they lost their, their wagons and a lot of their supplies and um, saw what they were up against. Um, they only moved faster. But by the time uh, the Americans somewhat slowed them enough that they were forced to camp overnight at the southern end of Ridgefield. So yeah, it's part of the American strategy worked, but uh, no, not as fully as Worcester would have hoped. Well, what uh, another question, and uh, actually uh, one of uh, the attendees posted a website, but I wanted to hear from you. The attendee wanted to hear from you about the pension records. I think people would be interested to know, is that something like I could or anyone can access the pension records that you've researched? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of information about pension records and researching them online. It's it's done often for genealogy, for joining sons and daughters of American Revolution, and for projects like this. Yes, um, where Richfield is using a website known as uh, Fold Three, uh, which does have a subscription, but you can access those federal records there. Otherwise, I don't know what it's like with COVID still, but any National Archives satellite, um, you know, up in Massachusetts, uh, you could go to as well. I'm sure there's several ways to access them, but they're increasingly common. And, and you know, very rich. Yes, the, uh, our attendee, I'm sorry I missed the name of the person who posted, <clears throat> mentioned Fold3. That's a subscription service, I guess, uh, but uh, still good to know and we can follow up on that. I did want to note for the audience that uh, another attendee posted that um, the uh, 5th Connecticut Regiment is the one that's doing the reenactment of the battle on the uh, 30th um, and their website is 5cr.org. So just wanted to uh, put that URL out there. Um, another uh, attendee had asked uh, if this battle took place while the British were trying to split the colonies in two. I don't know if that attendee is still on, but uh, I, that's the question. I, I don't know whether you can speak to that. I think it's just about maybe about like, what, you know, where in the war did this happen? I know you covered that briefly, but maybe you just want to. Yeah, and like uh, just a couple seconds is the beginning of that strategy that is attempted that like uh, accumulates in the Battle of Saratoga that might be what the you know, attendees thinking of. Um, it, it's uh, in this case, not so much. The, the thought really is to at least knock out some continental supplies and gain some sort of additional loyalist support, who knows what that form would take, but this actually sort of backfired, I think, after that, the British column marching through and the damage they, they caused and the, the local sentiments that were raised um, pro-American, it, it just, if anything, made it harder to be a loyalist in the region, I guess, after this event. The British also learned they shouldn't march so deep into rebel territory unsupported, and this shows up in multiple correspondences throughout the war uh, to the very end towards Yorktown. It, it's uh, yeah, I think it was their only, yeah, their only attempt, right? Um, another poster, and this is the beauty of uh, local historians and uh, crowdsourcing facts, I think, because a poster, uh, an, another attendee mentioned that uh, the lake, um, and they, they said Naraneka, no, I don't, Lake Naraneka, did we mean a, yeah, Lake Naraneka, um, was dammed in 1937. And so the, the current shape of the lake is different than probably what was there perhaps back in the day. So that's just a fact. Uh, and I love the fact that people are posting that sort of thing um, to, to make note of, Dave, or just, just wanted to put that out there. Um, let's see, we're, um, that's it for the questions from the group. Is there any other? Oh, let's see. We have a couple of QAs, a couple of questions here. Let's see. Oh, I think we're, I think that's about it for, for us right now, David. So um, Nancy, did you want to uh, say any last words about the upcoming events? Oh, thank you. And, you know, I'll, what we'll do is everybody who's attended tonight will send an email tomorrow and just sort of let you know because in a month there's the 245th anniversary. We have David and a bunch, you know, the state historian, the state archaeologist, and several other um, people coming into town. There's a lot going on. So we'll send that to you tomorrow, but nothing more to say tonight. Thank you. I think that's well, thank it. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, that was excellent. Oh, I do have one question, my own a question for myself. This report that you mentioned, is that going to be something that's going to be given to the Historical Society and made available online? Yeah, as we uh, come it's up. Already since, available. Yeah, it's since we covered this, we uh, close up here. I'd like, maybe I'd like to, again, say thank you for the opportunity to share all this. The report at some point, um, the latest version should be accessible. Um, for everybody attending, thanks for joining us. And we only really missed about three other slides where we just really discussed the encampment, which is really the end of this battle, finishing things off. And again, upcoming events. There's a lot happening in Ridgefield and locally in, in April. And you know, we hope to, to see you there. And, and hopefully this provided you with some uh, exciting new background information. So again, thanks again.
appreciate it. And David, you're uh, just to, just before you go, you're going to be demonstrating some battlefield archaeology. Uh, uh, yep. So on the uh, Ridgefield Historical Society website, you'll uh, see more about the reenactment, the talks. Uh, we'll have probably a condensed version of this, uh, I promise. And uh, there will be a uh, heritage consultants will be hosting a, um, a, a battlefield archaeology demonstration at the Historical Society. Saturday mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Yeah, that's Saturday. Or come on by if you'd like to learn how to screen some dirt, swing a metal detector, see how we do our stuff. And also landholders that are wondering what will take place. This would be a great time to check it out. Yeah, I think that'll be really uh, informative session. So thank you very much, David, and thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a great night.